Welcome to the Rise to the Challenge podcast. Joining me today, he's the gold medalist in the decathlon of the 2008 Olympics, track and field athlete, speaker, entrepreneur, and the co-founder and president of Eat the Frog Fitness. It's Brian Clay. How are you doing today, Brian? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Well, we're excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Yeah, so I grew up in Hawaii. Um, you know, as a as a small child, I I you know maybe didn't make all the best decisions, got into a little bit of trouble here and there, but um, but for the most part, uh, grew up there and um, you know started my track career there. Uh, everything you know went well, and I ended up getting a college scholarship to go to Azusa Pacific University. Um, that was one of the many colleges that I was, you know, looking at and choosing from. And then from there, I went ahead and went um, on to, of course, my first world championships and first Olympics and then second Olympics and, and all that good stuff. So that's kind of how it all started. Was there a specific moment that you found the passion for track and field or did it kind of just happen naturally? Um, I think, you know, it kind of happened more naturally than anything else. My mom uh, basically I was in some counseling and my mom, uh, was told by the counselor that she needed to get me involved in sports. And I'd always been a good runner, you know, when I would play like at, out in the field with the kids and stuff, and I was always one of the faster kids and, you know, could pick up things pretty quickly. I was, I was a visual learner. And so I could see somebody do something and I could usually copy it. And, and then I would try to do it better. Cause I was just very competitive. Um, and so, uh, my mom, you know, got said I could either run track and field or swim. I tell everybody I was so afraid of wearing a speedo that I chose track and field. Um, and that was kind of the start of track. Um, but, but as I started track or began to run track, I, I realized that it was something that, um, that just felt good. Um, it was something that I could control. It was something that, um, you know, that nobody else could kind of, uh, make me do good or make me do bad. It was just, it was, it was all about how hard I wanted to train, right. And how hard I wanted to push myself. And, um, and, and there was a real like winner and loser, right. It was like either you won or you didn't, you know? And so, uh, so those are kind of some of the elements that I really liked. And, 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 um, as I would train, it, it became, you know, therapy for me. It became something that, um, you know, helped me deal with, uh, just the uncertainties and the different things that were going on in my life at the time. And so um, I would say the track became my sanctuary. Um, it became the place where everything felt right. And not that the world was perfect, but, but it was the one safe place that, that to me, everything felt right. Um, and I could run myself into the ground to a point to where I would feel like I had to just give up because I, was I wasn't in control of it. And, uh, and there's some freedom in that. And, and so I was able to find that daily training and and that's why it became something that was so uh, uh, important to me. You talked about it being a sanctuary. Was it more like an escape from the things that were going on in your life, like things that you didn't have control of? Because you talked about how you were the one in control of what the outcome would have been in a track event or a track and field event. Right. You know, I think, um, it, you know, I would say it was a bit of an escape because, you know, when you go out to the track, it doesn't matter where you're from or who uh how much money you have or you know anything like that it's just you know you go out and it's just whatever you were born with and however hard you wanted to push yourself so so it was an escape from from that but but really what happened is i think there was a psychological um uh kind of process that was happening and i and i think that you know a lot of us we try to control every aspect of our life if you're like me anyway I, I i like i like being in control i like planning i like all of those types of things i like knowing what to expect if i do something the result is going to be x um and and in my life that wasn't happening and so you tend to like you know like it just throws you for a loop right like it's it's hard when you're a control person like me um or a planner or whatever it might be and, and things start to get all out of whack, it just kind of throws you for a loop and it frustrates you and it makes it hard and, um, and you find yourself in a bad mood and, and then throw in the fact that I wasn't making good decisions, right, because I wasn't mature enough at the time, um, my life was just kind of chaos for a little while. Um, and so when I would go to the track, the ability to be frustrated 
or angry um, and, and, you know, about the fact that I couldn't do some of the things that I wanted to do or that things were happening that I didn't want to happen or I emotionally I couldn't deal with the things that were going on in my life. When I could run, I would, I would be so exhausted and mentally and, and physically and emotionally and spiritually at the end of a practice that you would just get to a point to where you would, you would kind of just give up and you would say, listen, like, I don't, you know, you wouldn't fight against yourself anymore. You wouldn't fight against, you know, what life was throwing at you. You would just get to a point to where you would realize I can't do it. And, and you would take a step back and, and it would remind you that, hey, listen, you can only control this little piece right here. Like I can only control how hard I run. Yep. I can only control whether or not I get back up and do the next rep. I can't control anything else. And, and that's what I mean. Like when you realize that you can't control anything else and you can only control the things that you personally or physically can do, um, there's freedom in that. There's there's freedom and understanding, like, why am I stressing so much about something that I just can't control? Why am I trying to control something that I, that I can't control? Like, the, you know, I, I, I can't focus on that stuff. I can only focus on the things that I can control. And really right now, especially at that age, the only thing I control was me. Um, and so, so I would, you know, again, not that I was, um, not that that helped me make any better decisions or, or anything like that, but it was just a place of freedom. It was a place where the weight was lifted off my shoulders. I didn't feel like I, you know, was responsible or that I had to figure all these things out. I just realized that I, I wasn't going to be able to. And, um, you know, things like my parents' divorce, um, things like, uh, you know, um, not doing well in school, right? And, and, and struggling to, to like, <clears throat> to read or to, to, to get certain concepts and things like that. Not necessarily the effort, right? Getting put in, but, but things that were like, you know, that were just hard. Um, you know, those types of things, I couldn't control the way my mom felt, or the way my dad felt, right? Um, or the decisions that they made. And I wanted to, and I tried to, um, and I was angry that I couldn't, and I was angry about what was going on in my life. But, but um, the fact of the matter is, no matter what I did, um, you know, I wasn't going to change that. Um, and, and coming to that realization came, you know, those types of realizations would come when I was when I was so tired that all the distractions that were going on in my life kind of, you know, were gone because I, I couldn't think about them. And, and when I, it was quiet, you know, which often was when I was laying on the track, you know, dead tired. Um, my brain wasn't going a thousand miles an hour because, you know, I was focused because I was, I was so exhausted. Um, you know, that's the kind of time um, that, that clarity, you know, for me um, became real. And I think that's why um, so many people love to run. You know, I still, to this day, if I go on a run, it's, it's often where I'll do a lot of thinking. You know, it's where I'll, you know, solve the world's problems, if that's what you want to say, you know, call it. Um, but it just becomes a, a very, you know, nice place where I can think, where I can um, get away from distractions, where, where everything feels like right. And, and it makes it easier to, to deal with some of the, the issues that might be going on. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Anytime they do something that they're passionate about or something that they enjoy, that they kind of block out what's going on and then they're focused on that path. Like I'm usually walking around my neighborhood, going by lakes and wa water areas. And to me, that's just enjoyment. It's kind of like freedom in a way. You don't have to yeah. think what's happening at my house right now. So yeah. I definitely can relate to those experiences and a lot of people can. When you were going into track and field, was there a specific event that you wanted to participate in? Uh, no, not really. I mean, you know, for me, it was more about uh, just being good at all of them. I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to, if somebody did an event and thought they were really good well I wanted to do that event and I wanted to show that I could do it better right or if somebody said hey you should try this one I wanted to try it and see if I could do it better so um it wasn't really about you know any particular event it was more about um the challenge you know more about how how well could I do how hard could I push um how quickly could I pick it up and could I do it better than than the other person so was there an athlete that inspired you or someone that motivated you to do the things that you did? 
Uh, I wouldn't say there was an athlete that inspired me. Um, I think that for me, I, uh, I, I just loved the c competition. I loved, you know, track and field, even in practice, it's a competition. So, you know, team sports, you know, a lot of times you'll go, um, you know, you can, you can kind of go easy or, or I shouldn't say go easy because that's not the right term, but, but you're not going wide open all the time, right? Like I watch my son when he plays football, it's like, sometimes, you know, they go with no pads and they'll just kind of, you know, go through, you know, technical stuff or drills or those types of things. And there's not a lot of like one-on-one -on -one competition happening, you know, all the time. Track's a little different. You know, when you step on the track, even when your coach is like, hey, we want you to run 75% today, you know, it's you and six other people lining up on a line and, and, no matter what, at the end of the day, you're going to, you're going to run a certain distance and somebody's going to be first across the line and somebody's going to be last across the line, right? Yeah. Even in training. And so there's always this idea of like, you have a very clear picture of like, who's the best and who isn't. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's what I love. I, I loved that every time you stepped on the track, every time you threw something, every time you jumped, there was a very clear picture of who the winner was, um, even if it was in training. And even if your coaches and everybody told you it didn't matter, you, you knew who the best was. And, and I loved being the best. So, you know, that's what I fed off of. And, and I think that's what kind of kept me going. Um, when I look at athletes that, that I was growing up, I grew up in Hawaii. And so um, when I was growing up, there were no real um, track and field athletes out there. Um, and so I didn't really have a lot of track and field athletes to look up to. And so, um, you know, we're kind of forging our own path in that, in that respect. But, um, but I had a, a, an amazing coach. I had a couple of amazing coaches that um, played a huge role in, in the early years of my track and field. Um, you know, my, my first coach was uh, a coach. Uh, his name was Duncan McDonald. Um, he was a coach out in Hawaii and he coached kind of club, the club track and field scene. So when I first got into track and field, he was one of my first coaches and, and, you know, he did just a great job of, of creating um, a team and an atmosphere that, that a kid like me could feel uh, welcoming. Um, and, and I could just learn the sport and learn the events. And he's had, he had some success in track. And so, you know, understanding that he had gone and run at a national level and run in college and different things like that was always great. And he was still an active runner, um, and so that was, you know, aspiring, I think, or inspiring, you know, when we, when we'd see that as young kids, but um, then I moved on to high school and then I had my, my high school coach, his name was uh, Martin. He, he passed away a few years ago, but he was, he was almost like a dad for me. Um, you know, he wasn't just helping me with, with track. He was helping me with, with life problems as well. Um, and so uh, being able to, sorry, there's a bug. Um, <laughs> being able to uh, uh, just have somebody like that, um, that, that was in my life that loved track and field. He was older. Um, he was competing uh, in the police and fire games, you know, uh, and things like that. Uh, being able to watch him and just see his passion and love for the sport was, was great as well. Um, and then, you know, of course, if you move into my collegiate career, um, Kevin Reed was, was my head coach. Um, he handled, you know, basically all of my training, um, and kind of headed up the team of coaches that we then built after that, which was, you know, Mike Barnett, who was my throws coach. Um, I had Raina Ryder, who was, you know, kind of our sprint technician, kind of jumps technician coach. Um, you know, just a whole bunch of people that, that were part of the team. And, and Kevin really, even to this day, has been a great friend um, and, and just a great, uh, you know, coach. And, um, you know, had this knack for, you know, getting you to believe in yourself, getting you to, to do things that you didn't think were possible or that you even wanted to do. Right. And, um, and, and that was, you know, just amazing. And so, so I think my coaches all played, you know, huge roles in, in, you know, kind of inspiring me to continue on uh, more so than any athlete. Um, just because of, I think, my situation growing up and, and not having like that hometown hero, right, that, that um, so many kids nowadays get to, yeah. get to see. And especially, you know, for us, the world of no internet, you know, no, uh, no cell phones, no nothing. Like in Hawaii, you, you almost felt a little bit removed. And so the only way you knew what was going on in the world is if you had cable or if you um, were watching the news. And um, I didn't have either of those, you know, for a while as I was a young kid. And so, um, 
so so yeah so we, we didn't really have um, maybe some of those luxuries during your collegiate time was the main focus on track and field and being an athlete or did you kind of have to think about a backup plan in case if an injury came up or other passions came about yeah no for me it was track all the way uh there was no plan b um i mean I would have figured it out, but, but I, you know, I can tell you, I didn't, I didn't know, nor was I planning for what was going to, you know, happen if I didn't make it. Um, and I think that's, you know, you know, I would never tell my kids to do that. Right. Like I would, I would tell my kids like, Hey, listen, you need to have plan B. This may not work. Um, and I had people, I had professors that would tell me that I had people that would tell me that, but, um, but in my mind, um, there was one thing that I wanted. It was, I wanted to be a professional athlete. I had known that since the time I was little, um, and I was going to do everything I could to make it there. And, and I was continuing to hit goals along the way. And, and I was continuing to progress along the way. And so, um, outside of like an injury or outside of, you know, just, um, you know, something happening, um, I didn't have any reason to believe that I couldn't do that. And I also, you know, I think my, my, um, my expectations weren't that I was going to make millions of dollars and, you know, and, and have this nice cush life. My expectations were, I just wanted to be a professional athlete. You know, I just wanted to go compete at the Olympics. Um, and, you know, I thought maybe a little bit of money and stuff would come, but I didn't expect my life to change very much at all. Um, and so I knew that I was going to have to figure something out afterwards. I got my, uh, my degree in social work, um, you know, which I have no idea what I'm going to do with that degree now. <laughs> Um, which I feel like is what so many collegiate um, college, you know, uh, 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 kids that go to college say when they graduate, you know, college graduates. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, that would have been, I guess, my fall, my, you know, my fallback plan, I would have probably sat back and, and gone and, and started doing some counseling or, or some something of that nature. Um, and who knows where life would have been. But, um, but other than that, there was, there was really no plan B. It was, I was going to make it or, or I wasn't. So why the decathlon out of all the events you could pick, you kind of picked the one that kind of incorporates a lot of them into one set. So what made you draw towards that? Yeah. So the decathlon, um, it, you know, honestly, it was just the event that I got recruited for. Um, I was, uh, I, I competed in Hawaii growing up, I, you were able to do six events on, on any given, uh, uh, you know, at, at any given track meet, which is a little different than some of the other places. I think like when you're in, um, sorry, I'm just fixing my camera here. Uh, when you're in, um, uh, I think in like California and some of the other kind of continental, you know, U.S. Uh, places, you're able to do, I think, four events a night. In Hawaii, you were able to do six and so I would do six events on like a Wednesday night. And then I would do six events on like a, a Friday night. And one was like prelims, one was finals. Um, and so that's kind of how my, my, my high school career went. And so I think when my coach from Azusa Pacific, I mean, a lot of other schools were recruiting me as a sprinter jumper, because that's primarily what I did. Um, but when my coach from Azusa Pacific, who, who is very familiar with the decathlon, they've got a strong, long history of the decathlon. Um, he had a bunch of decathletes that he was training when he saw what I was doing, you know, I think his mind immediately went to the decathlon and, um, and because the specific was the school that I chose to go to school at, um, the decathlon is what I, what I kind of fell into. And so, um, you know, when I heard about the decathlon, I, I, I thought it was really great. It was, it was so much fun. There's history there. There's, um, you know, it wasn't like I was just being used in one area. I got to do a little bit of everything, right? And so um, when I would go to nationals, I could long jump, I could high jump, I could run the hundred, I could be on the four by one team, I could, um, you know, I could do all kinds of different events um, and score all kinds of points as opposed to just running the hundred and, and, you know, being out. If I didn't run well, then I was out for, you know, in that first round or second round and that was it. Um, and so I loved that kind of versatility and, and being able to be used and having an impact. I loved, you know, when we would compete at nationals, I was able to, to score a bunch of points, you know, in a bunch of different events. And, and that would help my team and, and, you know, push my team onto national champions or championships and things like that. Um, 
and so that was just cool and i and i enjoyed that so once i fell into it and i realized the versatility and how it was going to be used um you know but i think there's a whole bunch there's a whole story there about like not being at a division one school and being at what we had as an nai school um but uh you know that was all you know amazing um and and i thought it was the greatest thing ever and, and i just fell in love with you know the sport um started to learn about the history started to look at you know the people that had come uh before uh, i had and and the stories of of these amazing you know two-day battles that they would go through to see who's going to come out on top and um and that was just cool and then you start to learn about things like um, uh, the, uh, uh, the title that is given to the decathlon winner, right? Of you get to call yourself the world's greatest athlete. Um, and that's one of two titles that are given out at the Olympic games. There's only two. Um, and, and those two titles go to the world's fastest man who wins the hundred meter dash. Um, and then the world's greatest athlete who wins the decathlon and, and the history behind that with King Gustav, you know, uh, uh, talking to Jim Thorpe and, and telling Jim Thorpe, you know, you, sir, are the world's greatest athlete. Like that's, that's just cool history. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you hear people talk about, you know, who's the world's greatest athlete and all these things and all that kind of stuff. But, but, you know, the, the thing that's so cool is that the history of, of where that came from and, and why that was given to who it was given to. And, and you look at what we're facing today with all the political, unrest and the craziness that's going on in the world today um and and you look at the fact that you know the the king of sweden was able to look at a a um you know a really a, a you know a, a, a you know a poor um minority you know uh, uh boy or young man and and give him you know the first kind of title of the world's greatest athlete i mean it just shows you how sports transcends all of that stuff. And, and it really can bring the world together and there's just powerful moments and things like that. And, you know, the decathlon is more of a brotherhood. I mean, all those things make it such a great event. Um, and so when I started to do it, I just, there was nothing else for me that that was the event that I was going to do. Out of all the events that are in the decathlon, did you have a favorite, like the one that, Oh, this is so much fun. I wish I could have done it longer or this is the main focus or the overall yeah. look was good um you know they I, I always tell people they all have their good days and bad days you know and and it's kind of like having kids like you really don't want to um you know pick one that's better than the other because you know the danger in that is is that you you end up starting to practice one of those events more or it's easier to practice one of those events more than it is to practice another one and so you really get your head in a space where it's like you just they're all good and they're all bad at times and that's really the truth I mean it's like on any given day you could be training and and the event that's your worst event you could have a, an amazing practice in and the event that's your best event you could have the worst practice you've ever had in. and and I've had many of those days right um and so uh I would say that the event you know, no favorites, but, but, you know, some of the events that I think, uh, provide some, some really amazing, um, uh, uh, experiences for me was always the javelin. Um, you know, it's not that I was the best javelin thrower. I was a good javelin thrower, but, um, but it was more about the, the time that you threw the javelin. And so the javelin, if you don't know the the Olympics is broken up into two, um, kind of, uh, uh time frames. You have the, the morning sessions, and then you have the evening sessions and there's usually like a siesta type break in the middle of the afternoon. And so, um, um, decathletes, we compete through all both sessions and actually even during that kind of break in the afternoon. So there's actually a period where we're competing in the Olympic stadium and it's empty. There's nobody in there, you know, very few people in there. Um, and, and you know, we, that's just kind of how we roll. Like, you know, if, if, as if it wasn't hard enough already to compete for two days, you know, to, you know, 12, 13, 14 hour days, sometimes two hour, three hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. Um, you know, they'll throw in weather, which, you know, you can't control. And then, and then you get to be the one of the lucky ones that gets to compete when the stadium's empty, you know, so we we're talking about Tokyo and, and all this stuff and some friends. And I'm like, well, listen, as a decathlete, like, there's, there's many times where we've competed in stadiums that there's nobody there, you know, so we, we understand that we get it, it wouldn't be anything new for us. Um, but um, 
the 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 javelin happens in the evening session and the evening sessions are the ones that are usually in terms of fans that are sold out um everybody comes to the evening sessions because that's when all the finals of the events happen so the usain bolts and and all those guys are running their finals in the evening and that's when world records are being broken and you know it's just amazing and all that stuff and so um for for the javelin you're usually in the evening session um the stadium's full and there's not a whole lot going on because you're still kind of you know one of the you're kind of finishing up your day um and so as as you are throwing usually you've got the entire stadium and they're really able to watch just you and it's the one time where you get to kind of cross the track back up to the stadium you know behind you so the seats are right there because you usually run down and then you know throw it into the field um and so that was always just a fun you know time of competing because it was the one time in the decathlon where you had everybody there watching um and it was like a final almost and so you would uh you know you 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 know get the crowd clapping for you and you run down and you throw and if you had a really good throw the crowd would you know cheer and um and it was just kind of it was just a really special time um and then you know i could always tell you the event that that i you know struggled with the most right so not that it was my least favorite but i just struggled with the most and that was the 1500 the very next event um and and that again not so much that you know i'm not a distance runner by any means i don't pretend to be it's you know that's a, a hard event but um but you know what made that even harder is the fact that it was the last event it was the 10th event and and by that time um you know mentally and physically and emotionally and spiritually you're drained i mean you've had two very long days um and you've just beat your body up um and so then to 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 end with your you know for me what was my probably worst event right like that's the one that i i didn't do as well as i did all the other ones in um that was just always tough mentally mentally that was a that was a real hard place to get to. And, and it's not like I was, you know, terrible. I mean, I was still running a five minute mile. It's not, you know, I wish I could run that now. Right. But, um, but, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's just more the mental aspect. It's the, it's the entire situation that you're in. You're, you know, if you're leading, everybody's looking at you and they're figuring out what they have to run to try to beat you. Um, you cannot, you know, just, do nothing like you have to actually show up and, and still you know compete and still finish um and and you know if it's not your favorite event it's like man you know it's gonna hurt it's gonna hurt and it's gonna suck and it's gonna be five minutes of absolute torture and you can't give up you can't you know coast and be like oh, i got this i mean you know all those things you know can't happen and and uh and that's just a you know, every time it was a battle for me, every single time I had to, you know, in my head, get myself, you know, prepared to, to go do that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it was, it was difficult. It, I don't know if there was ever an easy one for me to run. They were always, didn't matter how much I was leading by, um, they were always, uh, it was always a tough, tough race for me, um, to kind of get my head into. Yeah, I enjoy watching track in the field, but if you put me on a track, I'm like, nope, can I leave right now? Because I am just yeah. not, like, we used high school, they made us do like miles and stuff. And I'm like, when's this over? Like, yep, yep, watch, I rather watch the athletes do it because it's more entertaining sitting and watching. Right you're just cheering but let's well, talk I like, about, I like to watch too so now <laughs> now let's talk about that olympic journey you participated in two different olympics what was it like representing team usa and getting that opportunity to go to these other countries and perform at a high level yeah you know the, the there's i i when i was growing up i always wanted to compete right but it wasn't like to to compete it wasn't like the I guess you should say the the joy or the honor wasn't going and representing my country. The honor was getting to compete at the highest level in the world, right? Um, but and so I didn't have much expectation in terms of pride of country. Um, but when I when I went to my first Olympics and you walk out, uh, you know, from under the stadium uh, in the you know the opening ceremonies, 
and all the countries have, have walked out before you we're usually kind of you know the very end. tail end right which is yeah. kind of cool um but um all the other countries walk out in front of you and and you know you're you're gearing up and you're getting ready to enter you know the tunnel outside and and the stadium's full and you can hear the the celebration going on and the, you know you see the flashes of lights and the you know all the fireworks and all that stuff and you're walking down and you've got team usa and we're just this mob right there's just <laughs> all i mean we're huge we're you know 600 you know athletes or whatever um so you're one of the biggest teams there and um, and you just know, you just, you can feel the, the excitement and the energy in the air. And you just know that when you walk out, everyone is it, like, you are the envy of the world, right? And you walk out there and you come out of the, the stadium and people start cheering and you see U.S. flags being waved and you know that you have you know, this, this U S flag on your chest. And, you know, we had these little berets or hats that you had to wear. There's a U.S. flag there. And, and you know, that the TV cameras and, and literally billions of people are watching. Right. And, and they're seeing team USA and everybody's talking about team USA. And, and you start to realize what that flag stands for around the world. Um, it's, it, there's just nothing better. I mean, it is just an amazing, amazing feeling. Um, there's so much emotion, uh, so much pride, um, all of those things that, that, you know, that happen. And so, um, you know, again, I, I started out not thinking that much of that and, and then got to experience that moment. Um, and, and the pride that comes with that is unbelievable. And so then I was on the, uh, the podium and I was standing there and, um, you know, there, there's a, the podium are set up so that third is the lowest, second is kind of, you know, in the middle and the first is the highest. And, um, and the flags as they're raised during the medal ceremony are raised kind of in that same, you know, hierarchy. Um, and then when, it, when they finally get to the top of where they're going, um, the national anthem of the winner uh, is played. And so, you know, I was standing on the podium. I had gotten my silver medal at the at that time, and the flags were going up. And I'm like, "Well, this is amazing. There's the U.S. flag, and everybody's watching." But then, when it gets to the top, they play the Czech national anthem because the guy that won, my competitor, was from the Czech Republic, um, and and that was that hurt a little. I didn't think that it would, but it it hurt a little. Not that I got second. I was super excited that I got second, but it didn't feel right when. I felt like I had the best meet of my life. I had a personal best, one of the highest scores in, in U.S. history. Um, and then to, to hear the Czech national anthem get played, it was like, oh, like that's, that's not how it's supposed to go. You know, I was like, it, you know, that should be the U.S. national anthem. And, and so that was one of the, the you know, the things that I, I remembered and I, and I didn't want that to happen again. I wanted to be at the top of the podium. I wanted to have my Olympic moment be when I was standing there with my gold medal on my, you know, chest, you know, seeing the U S flag and the backdrop of the, of the, the Olympic stadium and listening to the, the U S national anthem be played and have everyone around the world watching, knowing that I, I made the hardest team in the world to make. And then I came onto a world stage and conquered, you know, what the best the world had to offer and and then to see my flag be raised, hear my national anthem be raised, and and at this point in my career, having been all over the world, having seen what the rest of the world looks like, and how some of the operations around the world happen, and knowing what our flag stands for, like, the, like it was just one of the proudest moments of my life, and and um, I can't imagine uh, uh, you know anything topping that, you know, in terms of a, 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 a athletic you know, uh, experience. And so it was just amazing. I mean, it was absolutely one of the most amazing times and one of the, the biggest honors I've ever had. Um, I'll never forget it. And I hope, you know, all the athletes that are competing, you know, right now in Tokyo have the opportunity to, to have that happen for them. When, after you won the gold in 2008, did you ever feel like I need to go and defend this gold? Like I need to go back to the next Olympics and get my gold medal back and not have someone else win it? Um, I didn't feel the need to not let anybody else win, but I, I felt the need to kind of continue to train. I, I, you know, I had to figure out what I wanted to do. I remember having some conversations with my coaches and they were like, listen, you know, if you, you know, when you come, if you compete again, 
you know, you're going to like sponsors are going to be great and the money and this and that, and you could be the first person to ever win three Olympic medals in the decathlon and, and all these types of things. And I was like, yeah, listen, that's great. But like, what you don't understand is like, you take yourself to Helen back every single day for four years. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's just hard. You know, it's, it's a really, it's, it's hard to, to mentally. And I always say it mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, you know, deplete yourself every single day, every single day, you're taking yourself to the brink and then, and then, you know, trying to recover and then getting up the next day, doing it all over again. And, and so I was like, I have to find some other reason to, to kind of do it if I'm going to do it. Cause you know, I had bought a house already at the time I, you know, I was married, I had kids. I mean, you know, life was comfortable, you know, so why, why be uncomfortable, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, and, and, and then I, you know, I kind of found my own reasons and decided that, you know, yeah, I was going to try and make another team. And so I trained, I did train from 2008 to 2012. Um, and, and, you know, that started out well, but, um, but, you know, as your body gets older at the time I was, you know, uh, what 30, 2012, I would have been, uh, sorry, 28 and two. So I was 30 between 28 and 32 training, you know, for that time period. And you kind of hit that 30, you know, year. And it's like, you know, there's just a, a little switch that kind of got flipped on me. And it was like, my body just wasn't recovering, you know, like it, like it used to, um, training days were taking me longer to recover from injuries were becoming more prevalent. Um, you know, daily little aches and pains were just, you know, getting harder and harder to deal with because they're just stacking on top of each other. And so, um, in 2012, I competed at the trials again, um, tried to make my third Olympic team, uh, did not do, you know, competed okay, but, but had some really faulty events, you know, didn't do well in the hurdles, hit a hurdle, kind of fell, um, you know, had to get back up, you know, finish that, then went to the discus, found out that I was disqualified. You know, my coaches were trying to appeal, went to the discus knowing in my head that I was disqualified, you know, I think had three fouls in the discus, only to have them come back after the discus and say, oh, well, yeah, we'll let you in, we'll let you stay in the competition. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me now? I just fouled three fouls in the discus, three throws in the discus. And so I was, you know, zero points there. Um, and at that point, it was like, there was no way I was making the Olympic team. Um, and so um, I finished the meet um, and, you know, and, and did that. But that was kind of the last meet I did. And I, and I just realized, like, at this point, uh, like, you know, I need this sport to be fun, you know, and I needed it to be, you know, something that I wanted, you know, like I said, it had to be more than just the money and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think towards the end of my career, it was just getting to a point to where um, the sport wasn't fun anymore it was starting to become uh work and um you just start to realize things about the sport maybe that that you know weren't um uh uh, you know you're not looking at the sport with the rose rose color you know glasses anymore you know you're seeing the politics and you've seen you've been around long enough now to see a lot of the things that happen behind scenes and um and you're wanting different things right you're wanting companies as sponsors that are that are loyal as opposed to, Hey, like, when was the, when was your last win? Like, you know, um, you know, just, just win more. And you're like, Oh my gosh, okay. I've won a, an Olympic silver. I've won an Olympic gold. I'm one of the highest scores ever in, in U S history. I I've won multiple world championships. I've been ranked number one in the world. Like I've done all these things. I'm, I'm actually one of the most de- decorated U S decathletes ever. Right. Um, and especially at the time. Um, and I'm like, how, like how much more can I do? And so, you, you know, like for me, I just got to a place where I realized like, you know, whatever I do, it's not going to be good enough for, Mm -hmm. for any, you know, for anybody. And so it had to be good enough for me. Um, And that was hard because, you know, you, you live in a world where your mind is always thinking like about the next win, the next win, the next win. So nothing's ever good enough because you're always going after what's the next thing. Um, And so, uh, so having that realization and, and all those types of things, I was like, listen, this, like, it's just not fun anymore. Like, this is not what I want to do. I, I don't want to live my life, you know, you know, having to feel like I have to prove myself to everybody every single day. I need to, I need to be at a place and I'm at a place where like what I, what I've accomplished, I think is enough. And, and it's, it's great. And I'm, I'm proud of it and I'm happy with it. And if that's not good enough for other people, well, then sorry, 
like, you know, you guys can hop on the track and, and, you know, try to figure it out yourself. But for me, it, it's, it's what it, you know, I was, I felt blessed and honored to have the career that I had. And, um, and it, in my mind, it was an amazing career. I still can't figure out how I did it half the time. Um, and, uh, and I decided that that was, that was good enough and I, I didn't need to, to prove it to anybody else. And so that was the, that was the end of my career. Did you ever think about coming back as a coach and helping like future decathlon athletes? Or was it like, you're just trying to remove yourself away from it for a time being? Yeah. You know, what's hard about coaching. I did come back and coach for a little while. Uh, what's hard for me about coaching is you, you know, it's difficult to find athletes that, um, desire, uh, uh, the same thing you did. And so it's hard to relate to people, right? It's, it's like really difficult when you, when you show up and you're coaching kids, you're spending the same amount of time, you know, on the track as you did when you were training and, and even more on, on the, you know, like the prep side, writing training and, and, and all that kind of stuff, which you're willing to do, you know, if somebody, if you can relate to someone's desire to, to be the best in the world, right? It's like, what, you know, in my mind, it's like, why else would you be out here if you don't want to be the best in the world, you know? Um, and so, you know, for me, like, I'm starting to realize that, hey, not everybody comes out here to be the best in the world. Like, that starts to get frustrating, you know, because it's like, well, like, I'm just wasting my time. Like, what, why am I, why am I doing this? If you don't want to be the best, you know, if you don't want to go to the Olympics, like, why are we here? You know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm not blaming the athlete at all. Like, that's just the reality. Like some people, not everybody wants to be, you know, an Olympic gold medalist, you know, some people come out cause it's, it's a sport that they love, but, but they're not trying to, they don't have aspirations of being that. Um, and in my head, it's like, everybody should feel that way. Right. <laughs> um, cause that was the way I thought. Um, and so, so, so coaching was, was difficult for me. So I enjoy coaching you know, on my terms, um, you know, I, I helped coach, you know, some kids out here in high school, um, cause they wanted to do, they wanted to throw the discus. And so I went out and helped them, you know, with that. And they had, you know, the next week, you know, through massive personal bests and things. I, I love doing stuff like that, but having to coach every single day, um, and not getting to decide who and when and how, um, that gets a little bit, I, I would say that's more draining for me than it is fulfilling. Um, but, but being able to kind of coach on my terms, like decide when and who, um, uh, and how we want to do it. Like that's, that's fulfilling for me. I, I enjoy that. And so, um, so I'll pop my head in here or there and coach. I, I still like watch video. I still study the sport. I still, um, watch athletes compete and, you know, have all my thoughts and my comments on, you know, their <laughs> technique and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but I usually keep that stuff to myself or to just with me and my, my wife and my, you know, my, my family. Um, and then if, if somebody reaches out or somebody, you know, uh, needs some help or something like that, I'm always down to like go and give them my opinion. But, but I, I take a step back now. I think I've realized now that it's like, listen, I had my time. Um, you know, I, again, I, I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody. I don't need anybody to remember my name. Um, in fact, most of the time people don't, uh, these young kids have no idea, you know, who I am. Um, and, and for me, that's okay. I, you know, I, I don't mind that. I mean, the people that I love, um, the people that are important to me, uh, were on the journey with me, um, and got to experience it with me. And, um, and that's, what's important. And, you know, if nobody else, you know, thinks that it was that great that's okay. <laughs> I'm on, I'm moving on to the other stuff. So I, I don't do a whole lot in the sport. Um, you know, um, I, 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 like I said, I'll, I'll pop in here or there if people want, but, but other than that, um, you know, I'm on to a new chapter in my life and I'm trying to, you know, be the best at that. And, um, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll achieve the same, you know, levels of success with, with, you know, this new chapter as I did with the, the previous one. I was going to say, I guess we're not going to see you on NBC commentating the track and field events. No. And, and you know, I, I'm probably not good at that. Right. It's like, I mean, I love to talk about the sport and, and I can sit and talk with people and do that sort of thing. And I've done some commentating before, but, um, but, but really, I mean, you know, those guys that do that, I think Otto Bolden is one of the guys that does that now. And, you know, they're, they're extremely talented and gifted and, and they're passionate about what they do there. And so, 
you know, so they study it and they, they, they become, you know, they've really gotten themselves to a place to where they're amazing at, at doing that job. For me, it was, you know, it was just hard. It, you know, it's like, I don't mind doing it. I love doing it. I study the sport and all that kind of stuff, but, um, but I don't know. Um, it just, it just wasn't something that I was really passionate about. Um, you know, I had been traveling all over the world. I, I didn't want to keep doing that. I like to be home with my family. Um, you know, I like track and field. I mean, it's, it's, or I should say, I love track and field. It's, I love the sport. I mean, it's, I, I love to watch it. You know, I love to be at track meets, but, but again, I want it to be on my terms, right? I don't, I don't want it to be something that I'm uh, enslaved to where I have to go because somebody's telling me that I need to be there. It's like, I want to go and just enjoy it. Um, I want to go and, 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 you know, do it because I love it, not because I, I have to. And, and, you know, that's what I was, I wasn't at the end of my career. That's, that's the whole issue that I was having, you know, um, and, and I don't want to go back there. And so, so I'll still go to track meets. I'll still watch it on TV. I'll, I'll still help coach here and there, but I want to do it on my terms, not someone else's. Speaking of what you're doing today, keeping with the athletic performance, you are the co-founder and president of Eat the Frog Fitness. I love the title because it's just, a ca it's catchy. Like it's something you'll remember. How yeah. did that get started? And what has been the best part about that experience? Yeah. So, you know, for me, it was, um, I was kind of, you know, we talked about the end of my career. I was finishing up my career um, and I had the, the pleasure of meeting, you know, some amazing people throughout my career. So at the time uh, it was Bruce Jenner, of course, now Caitlyn Jenner, um, you know, who was an amazing decathlete and, and, you know, will tell you he is probably, or she is probably the, um, the, the athlete, the Olympic athlete that is, that is capitalized off of one gold medal better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I mean, it's pretty amazing when you think about uh, 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 what, you know, she's done um, in order to, uh, to, to, to kind of create a, a career for them, for herself um, after the Olympic gold um, and just one Olympic gold. Um, I've also got to meet people and talk with people about like Carl Lewis, um, you know, one of the most decorated, I, I think he still is the most decorated U.S. men's athlete. I, I, I believe that Allison Felix um, might be one of the, 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 maybe the most decorated female track and field mm -hmm. athlete, and maybe even of all time. I, I can't remember. They've got so many medals. I can't remember what it is, but, um, but Carl, you know, just a legend in the sport, right? Um, and, 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 and so guys like that, I, I was able to, to meet throughout my career and do events with and, and share sponsors with and that sort of thing. And they, they all gave me some amazing advice, right? But one of the things that I had heard and I, I saw and watched is that, you know, when you think about your athletic career, your athletic career is, is this big, right? And, and your life is, is this big. Um, and so, you know, you want to use that athletic career to, to, as a jump start to everything else, but, but you really need to be thinking about what's going to come later and how do you capitalize off of, of, off of your, your accolades and the things that you accomplish um, during your athletic career, but set, use that to set you up as you move forward. And so, um, and so that was always kind of in the back of my mind, you know, and, and, and when you watch these guys, when you talk to these guys, and I would encourage, you know, younger athletes to, to do that, like find an athlete that's, that's done it, that's, that's built something and, and created something after the Olympics. Um, if that's what you desire to do and talk to them, because I, I'll tell you, I've learned so much from other, these other athletes, but not only that, I've learned so much since my career. And, and I would give athletes a totally different perspective than I think they're getting But those guys did not, you know, do what they did after their careers by mistake. Um, they, they did it because they were, you know, um, they were smart and they, they had people that were talking to them about those things and they were strategic about how they, how they did things. And so one of the things you learn is like networking is, is huge. Networking makes the world go round. And so I would watch Carl, I would watch uh, Bruce um, uh, in a room or sitting with CEOs of, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And I would, I would watch what they did. And, and I saw how they networked and I, and I would start to do that. And so, 
as I was um, done with my career, I was trying to figure out, you know, what is it that I want to do with my life? You know, I, I knew I didn't want to coach like we talked about. Um, uh, I, I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I had to kind of figure out, you know, what was going to be next. Cause you, you literally go from knowing what you do every single second of every day, um, to waking up one morning going, huh, like, what should we do today? You know, it's like, it's like a completely different life. Um, and so, uh, and so anyways, long story short, I, I, I kind of realized that I was, you know, I knew that I was passionate about fitness. I was passionate about people. Um, and I was looking at the fitness industry and I was saying, you know, listen, there's, there's nowhere out there that I would personally go work out at. Like, I, I don't like big box gyms, um, and, and feeling like it's a, it's a meat market and, you know, I'm having to be sold. People are trying to sell me, you know, personal training packages. And it's just like, you know, it felt like a used car a lot, you know, so to speak. And so, you know, I didn't like that. And, and I didn't like going in there and, 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 you know, having a guy next to me that's, you know, throwing up huge curls and dropping weight and trying to, you know, really is there to, to be looked at, you know, instead of like actually trying to accomplish, you know, a specific goal. Um, so just, you know, stuff like that, which is just dumb stuff that is my issue, not anybody else's, but, um, but those are just things that I didn't like, you know? And so, um, I wasn't a Zumba person, so I wasn't going to go and do Zumba. I wasn't a, um, a CrossFit guy. And so I wasn't going to go do CrossFit, you know, but I needed something that I wanted to work out at something that I felt like had, you know, some, some science behind what it is that they were trying to do that, um, that, that wasn't a one size fits all kind of cookie cutter workout of the day style, uh, uh, training method. Um, and I just realized there was nothing out in the industry, um, like that, that, that looked at the individual, um, found a way to, to kind of help the individual, but still kept, you know, some of the best things about the, the training in, in a group environment. So similar to what I did every day on the track, right? Like I had a different training plan than someone else next to me. I had to run at a different pace than someone else next to me, but, but we still trained together. We still used each other to sharpen, you know, uh, sharpen each other. And so what I thought was, is what if I brought, you know, the things that I, inspirations from all of my training and stuff. And I brought that to a group fitness kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, model, uh, business model. Um, but as I was doing that, I, I realized I didn't know anything about running a business. Uh, I wasn't a business <laughs> major. Um, I mean, I could, you know, add and subtract so I could kind of figure out some stuff, but um, I could, uh, you know, keep, keep a checkbook, you know, kind of thing, which most of the kids, if they're listening, don't even know what a checkbook is, but um, yeah. I could do those types of things. But, um, but I didn't know anything about the fitness industry, you know, or, or business models or, or anything like that. And so I kind of went through my Rolodex and, and realized there's, there's a lot of slimy people in the fitness industry, people that I didn't want to do business with. Um, and I found one guy that I had known for, a, 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 for years, his name was Joe Culver. Um, and uh, he was probably the one person that I felt like I could trust in the fitness industry. Um, he had had some fitness uh, big box gyms that he had started um, up here in the Pacific Northwest um, kind of, uh, a regional franchise, small franchise up here. Um, and so, um, so I gave Joe a call and I said, Hey, I've got this idea. And I kind of shared it with him and he was like, Brian, listen, it's, it's a great idea, but you're going to end up, you know, slaving away in the studio or in the gym, um, uh, just like you would on the track. And he's like, I don't think you'd be happy. It's not what you're looking to do. Um, and so he's like, just trust me. I, I don't think that's what you want. And I thought, crap, like, okay, well, that's not going to work. Um, but I was like, you know, as an athlete coming out of the career that I just, I was like, listen, I'll just do it and I'll figure it out. You know, I'll just make it work and I'll figure out how to do all this stuff. And then a couple of weeks later, um, Joe called me back and he's like, Hey, Brian, I've been thinking, I couldn't get this idea out of my head. Um, let's talk to my brother and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I really think that there's an opportunity here for this, but we just have to change some things in the model to make it scalable so that everything's not, you know, you're not required to be the linchpin for everything, meaning I'm not the one that has to be in the gym training each and every individual, um, but we can actually create a, 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 a model where it's, it's duplicatable by, you know, anyone. Um, and we could have coaches that take the things that I, you know, design and, and put together and, and actually, you know, coach those if we do it right, coach those and coach other people um, successfully. And so, so that's what we did. Um, and, and we decided to, uh, you know, as we were looking for names, we were looking at, we had a, a friend that was a, a ex Navy SEAL and, and that sort of thing. And, and the whole quote um, about eating a frog came up and um, there's some history there with some of the Navy SEALs and you know, called frogmen and all this stuff. But, um, 
but you know it's about in 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 our opinion in the way that we talk about it it's it's you know the quote is about you know eating a frog but but what it's really about is this idea that that you know there are challenges or difficult things or hurdles in life that we all or decisions in life that we all are faced with and they come daily um and a lot of those challenges hurdles decisions that you're going to face are things that would have you know uh, a lot of positive impact on on your life and and for some reason whether it's for fear whether it's because we're just you know exhausted um or maybe we just don't know what's going to happen or whatever it might be we we often will push those things off and not want to deal with them maybe it's because it's just hard you know um but whatever it is we'll push those things off and we won't deal with them and we'll say i'll deal with it tomorrow or you know we might give some effort towards it but we only give 50 percent effort well for us, you know, what we say at Eat the Frog Fitness is, is no, 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 like, you know, eat, you got to eat the frog every day. I mean, you got to wake up and know that, that you're going to take life head on, you know, with this champion mindset of, nope, I'm going to run at each hurdle head on and I'm going to, I'm going to attack it because that's where the refinement happens in order to become the best in the world. Um, and, and that's what we, we kind of preach at Eat the Frog, like, listen, for a lot of people, their frog, what we call it, you know, that, that one thing uh, is fitness. It's probably the one thing that can have the greatest impact, positive impact on someone's life. Um, and for some reason, people, they don't, they don't want to do it. You know, it's hard. It's scary. It's, it's, you know, you're uncomfortable, you, you know, all of those things. Um, you're just tired. You don't feel like it. Um, and, and so what we say is, listen, just eat your frog today. You got to eat the frog. Um, and it's become this mantra that, you know, all we call our frog squad, um, but our frog squad, you know, they talk about and it's something that, you know, we realize and they start to realize and people start to realize very quickly that when you begin to to um, adopt this mindset um, and, and you see the successes that you begin to have and the transformations that you get, begin to have in fitness, it begins to bleed into all other areas of life. And so you've got people that have testimonies about becoming better parents and better businessmen and women and, and better husbands and, 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 and wives and you know and all those types of things because it's that same mindset of, hey, listen, I'm identifying the things that I need to do that are gonna make me better. And rather than saying, I just don't feel like it today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna tackle it and I'm gonna get it done. Um, and I'm not gonna put it off till tomorrow or some other time. Um, I'm gonna do it right now. Um, and when you do that, um, I think you become more uh, effective and efficient at whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. And so, uh, so it's been really fun. Uh, we, we've built this, uh, we're just a few years old. We've got, you know, 24 locations right now where we've got another 30 locations that are in the pipeline that are coming to open. We're continuing, continuing to sell franchise licenses um, as we speak. Um, you know, members are happy. We're seeing lives transformed. Um, and, and it's been, it's just been amazing. And I've learned so much. I mean, so much that I've learned about business, about franchising, about, um, people and, and coaching. And, and I mean, just, you know, even about myself, I mean, I've just learned so much, um, over the last few years and, and it's been an absolute, uh, blast. It's been so much fun. That's awesome to see the the amount of work you guys have put in and the growth that it has. When you're training at your gym, are you feeling that you're pushing yourself to the next level, that you're almost getting to that shape that you were years ago, but now? No, now. <laughs> no I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be in, in any, that kind of shape anymore. I mean, that stuff, you know, it's, 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 it hurts your body. You know, in fact, we, the way that I designed our gyms or our, we call them studios, but the way that we designed our studios is I wanted to make sure that that people didn't feel like I do um, after, you know, working out for what we would call a long term fitness development program. Right. Like for us, that's the goal. I think for a lot of other brands, it's about getting you in and burning as many calories as you can on that one day because they have no idea if you're going to come back, you know, the rest of the week or, or even the next week or the, the next month. Um, and, and, you know, the dirty secret is that typically they're OK with that because, they don't want you to come back every day. They just want to ding your credit card every month. Yeah. Right? Um, for us, it's, it's different. I mean, community is huge. We, we want you, we want smaller membership numbers, but we want people who actually value their membership, who are looking to create, you know, long-term change in their life. Um, 
and, and or maintain um, a lifestyle that they currently have. And, and in order to, to have a long-term approach about fitness, you, you can't think about, well, I've got to burn as many calories as I can today. I've got to do as many hang cleans or, or snatches as I can today. Um, you know, you have to think about, Hey, listen, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? Um, you know, and, and you've got to kind of look at that and figure out, okay, well, if I'm trying to accomplish this, then what should my training look like? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and does that change or differ from the person next to me who's trying to do something else? Right. Um, and so, so those are the types of things that we're looking at and, and we help set people up on, you know, what we call training plans that, um, that help them accomplish whatever their specific goal might be. Um, now there are things that we, we do really, really well. And there's things that we don't do well because we've decided that's not our area of expertise. So for a lot of people, if they're looking to become a bodybuilder, like, you know, that's not, that's not the type of gym or, or, or fitness studio we, we are right. So, so of course there's room for other brands and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but if you're looking to improve your quality of life, you know, what, what I say is, um, you know, we call it being frog fit. And, and what that means is, is that, you know, to be frog fit means to, to have, to be in a physical state that doesn't hinder the des- your desired quality of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when you ask yourself, well, what is the quality of life that we're looking for? You know, what I tell people is, is can you, you know, can you hold your kids, carry your kids without your back hurting or without becoming winded? Can you chase after your two-year-old before they dart and get into the street and, and actually get to them in time? Can you run a 5k or turkey trot because your friends were like, Hey, let's all run the turkey trot this week. And, and you haven't really trained, but you know, you can hop in and at least, you know, even if you have to walk, you can get through it. Can you, you know, go on that hike that you drive by every weekend and you're like, huh, one day I'd love to be able to do that. You know, um, those are the types of things that I think create memories. Um, they allow you to, to, to kind of create um, uh, uh, opportunities and things in your life that you maybe didn't think were possible. And, and, and when you have those types of memories, when you can have those pickup basketball games with your kids or, or go on that, that hike or that 5k or, or what challenge yourself with your kids, you know, uh, or friends, like those are things that create a great quality of life. You know, um, that's the stuff that people look back on when they're older and go, remember that time when we, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. So remember that time when we hiked Mount Rainier, remember that time when we were playing basketball and this happened, or remember that five we ran and, you know, like those are the things that you think back on, you know, those are the memories that your kids will remember. Those are the memories that you remember. Um, and, and those are the things that, that, you know, really make life worthwhile. And so our goal is to, to help you find a physical state or maintain a physical state that helps you um, increase your quality of life or maintain your quality of life. And if we can do that, then, then, you know, then everything we do is worth it. And, and, and that's to me, what's important. So, you know, for a lot of people, they're never going to have that, you know, uh, sports illustrated swimsuit edition body right I like a lot of people are never going to have that especially me now like I'm not going to have the the men's health or men's fitness you know cover shot magazine body like that's just not the way it's going to be um, but also that's not what defines the quality of my life right <laughs> like I could care less about that like what I want to be able to do is continue to um, go wakeboarding and wake surfing and and you know uh, with my kids and, and go jet skiing and go to the beach and body surf and, you know, throw a football back and forth and, you know, uh, do those types of things, go on hikes, um, go on runs, you know, continue to challenge my kids to be better. Those are the things that I want to be able to do. And, and um, those are the things that, that our studio um, and our studios help people um, be able to accomplish and maintain. And um, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of a, a little different fitness model. And um, I think we're swimming upstream in a world that's, you know, swimming downstream, but, uh, but I've seen it change people's lives. And I've seen people, whether they're former Olympians or, or, you know, people that have never done fitness before in their life. Um, I've seen people find a place for themselves in our studios. Uh, it's not like, Hey, this is too intimidating, or uh, this is only for people that are crazy fit. Um, we've personalized every aspect of, of our, of our company. Um, you know, every piece of equipment can be uh, uh, modified or, or um, uh, changed in terms of tension and, and that sort of thing. 
to uh, to fit where you are. Um, just yesterday, we had I was working out as a former Olympian. We had um, a lady that was eight eight months pregnant that was working out. Um, we had uh, a few individuals that had never worked out before in their life. We had um, fourteen year old uh, kids all the way down to uh, I want to say nine year old kids all working out in the same uh, workout session, um, all getting the same intensity workout, even though it looked different for all of them. Um, and there's no other brand that, that allows you to do that. So, you know, I, I love what we get to do. The, when you said how like the big box fitness company is where it's you intimidate because the net person is next to you is trying to do all those big heavy curls. Yeah. I remember those moments working out when I was living somewhere else and I hated that. And that's why I just started buying equipment at home. Cause I'm like, I don't feel pressured about the people next to me. I'm focused on what I want. And like you said, the quality of life, that's how I do fitness for me because I'm trying to change so that it's not taken away from what I do, but it's right. just making me feel positive and mental clarity and everything. So I really like the concept that you guys have, and it's exciting to see what's next for you guys. So the final question I'll ask you, for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals, and rise to the challenge? Hmm. It's tough, right? Because I think um, a lot of times advice um, depends on the situation, right? Like, what is it that they're trying to accomplish? Um, you know, what skill sets do they have? You know, that sort of thing. But I, I think, you know, in general, what I always tell people, I speak on this a lot, um, is, you know, I think the first thing you need to do is you need to, you know, figure out a goal, figure out what it is that you're trying to accomplish and, and, and how to focus on that. I think, we live these lives that are, that are so full of distractions. We're distracted by every little thing that happens. And, and I just see from the time that I was a kid till now, you know, those distractions are just getting more and more prevalent because we have technology now that, you know, really allows everything and everyone to reach right into our daily life, you know, um, and, and, and pull us in, in different directions. And so, um, so really it's, it's, it's a trick. Um, and I have some exercises that I take people through to, to do this and some of the consulting and stuff that I do, but, but, um, but you've got to figure out a way to, to focus and eliminate distractions. And, um, once you kind of figure that out, um, and what that looks like, then, um, then you need to kind of create a plan and, and that plan needs to be a really, really detailed plan. Um, and so, uh, you know, those, those, again, those are all exercises and processes that you have to go through. And then the, the fourth thing or the third thing is, is you have to, um, surround yourself with good people. And so it's identifying those people in your life that, um, that are going to be there to go walk alongside that journey with you. Um, and then sharing that with them, what it is that you're trying to do and, and how you think you're going to get there, what your plan is to get there and, and asking for their permission to, to have them be one of, one of those kind of accountability, uh, partners in your life and, um, and, and meeting with them regularly and, and involving them in what's going on, you know, daily so that you can have somebody there to kind of look and see things with a little different lens, a little different perspective that sometimes you can't see when you're, when you're down in the weeds trying to execute, um, I think if you do those three things, um, I think the likelihood of you accomplishing your, your goals or your dreams, um, and like you said, rising to the challenge is, is very, very high. I think you can, you can do anything if you, if you do those three things. And so the trick is just buckling down and getting those things done. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people, I think that the real issue is they have goals or they have things that they say they want to do, but, but in the reality, um, they're kind of a, um, it'd be nice to do that, but not like, you know, I, this is what I'm going to do. Um, like you asked me in the very beginning, um, you know, did I have a plan B? Well, for me, I didn't have a plan B because this is what I wanted. And it was worth all the sacrifice. It was worth all the, the heartache and the hard work and all that kind of stuff to get it done. Um, and, and, you know, um, people are going to have to sit down and really ask themselves when they're doing that first step, which which is, you know, figuring out a goal is, you know, is this going to be worth it? And the, and the question that I always say is, is, you know, when you finally get to where it is that you're trying to go, will it be worth the price you paid? 
And so, you know, you've got to be thinking about that. Like, this is what I want. And is it going to be worth the price that I'm going to pay to get there? Um, and if your answer is yes, then, then I'd say go for it. If your answer is no, then I'd say you might have to sit, stop, rethink and, and try to figure out what it is that you, that you really want um, and what, what's worth the sacrifice, what's worth the, the, um, all the hard work to get there and then go after that. Well, Brian, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. No problem. Thanks very much. And, um, you know, if people want, and I don't know how you do things, but um, if people want, they can follow me on Instagram. I've got my, my link tree there. They can see about my fitness franchises. There's some life coaching opportunities that I do with, with some, some team members um, that they can take advantage of, but, but they can just follow what we're doing and reach out and, and connect with us there. And, and that's a great place for us to be able, I, I answer all my DMS. And so it's, it's just me there, but, um, but yeah, if people want to, you know, connect that, that would be the best place to do it.